I'm not aware of any algorithm for developing a proof. You need to look at the theorem, read it, reflect, and try and come up with an explanation of why it's true. We're going to walk through an example of, of this thinking process. Many of you have already successfully developed a proof for theorem 5 in, in our list of, uh, of theorems. Uh, we're going to use that particular theorem as our discussion uh, example. So in fairness, that theorem is no longer available for credit. Here's what the theorem stated. Every finite point set is closed. Now, all of this discussion is happening in the context of a set of axioms that we're developing. We're looking at a set of axioms that define what a topologist considers to be the real line. So where do we begin? What do we need to know to begin the proof? The theorem states that there's something about a finite point sets, and it talks about closed point sets. That's the place to begin. Be sure that you know yourself know what the definitions are. The definitions have to be the definitions that we're using in this particular context. So look back through the notes and identify and be sure that you know what the definitions are. So the context that we're working in, we're looking at a set of axioms that are going to finally define what the real uh, number line is to a topologist. Uh, so we don't have all of the axioms yet. We can only use the axioms that are available to us at this particular point uh, that have occurred before this particular theorem. Um, don't assume any properties about the real number line that haven't been specified in the axioms. So we're talking about sets here. Often we call them point sets. And those are always subsets of this space S that finally, when we're through defining all the axioms, is going to be the real number line. The definition of a closed point set as was given in the notes as a set F is closed if every point X not in F. That's kind of interesting. We're defining that F is closed by looking at everything that's not in F. If every point X not in F, there's some region containing X and not intersecting F. Whoa, do you see? To understand this definition, we also need to know what a region is. These definitions are becoming second nature to most of you by this point. But here's the definition of a region. You, first of all, you need to know that a point Z is said to be between X and Y if X precedes Z and Z precedes Y. The set of all the points between two points is called the region. The region uh, consists of all the points between X and Y and is denoted uh, as we've shown here in that. You, in, a, in a calculus class, you might have called that an open interval. We're calling it a region here. Okay, we uh, now understand what a closed subset is, what a closed set is. What about a non-empty finite uh, set? These notes assume that you know a lot about sets, what finite sets are, the intersections of sets, unions of sets, and so on. So all the definitions about things about sets are not given in the notes. You can get some pretty strong hints by how things are used in, in context throughout the notes. So go back and look at, at places that these terms are used. As I look back in the notes, I notice two places that these terms were referenced in Theorem 2 and Theorem 3. Theorem 2 said that every non-empty finite subset of S has a first point and a last point. Uh, theorem uh, 4 in the notes said that every non-empty finite subset can be ordered. So you can, you can label them A1 to AN. That's what we're meaning by a finite subset is that it has only N elements in it. And... Uh, Theorem 3, this theorem 4 from the notes is going to be extremely important to us in our proof. 
As I was thinking through the proof, I wasn't really sure which things were going to be important. I had to go back and look at, at all kinds of things and kind of sort out which things would be most valuable and, and meaningful or useful in the proof. Your first experience in developing proofs was probably in a high school geometry course uh, where you used this T-proof format um, in developing the outline of a proof. That's, that's not a, a bad strategy to begin with as you try to, to build a proof in almost any situation. Try and identify what the statement is that you want to make and give a reason for that statement. So as we walk through the development of this proof, we'll try doing it with a, with a T-proof format uh, to begin with. So we're looking at the, th at the theorem. Every finite point set is closed. We know what uh, finite uh, point set is. We know what closed means. Now it's worth noting that this theorem really is an if-then statement. It says that if, is a if F is a finite point set, then F is a closed set. That gives us a starting point, doesn't it? It says, suppose that F is a finite point set. Okay, so we're going to start, that's a given. So we start with a finite point set. We know that since F is a finite point set, that F has N elements by definition. And if we're going to look at F being closed, then we need to look at elements that are not in F. So, the, so we're going to look at X's that are not elements of F. Now this next step is not the first thing that I tried when I first examined this particular th uh, theorem. But uh, av after working through a couple of other proofs, I recognized that F, together with this point that was not in F, if I took the union of those, then, then that's still a finite set. And, but now it has N plus 1 points. Since that union is finite, we can apply theorem uh, 4 from the notes that says we can order those that set. Uh, we can label them and order, and order them in this way. Now notice that X is one of those A's. It's A sub something or another. And so there we are making that observation that there's got to be one of the, there's got to be some K so that X is equal to AK. Simply because X is one of the points in that union. Now there's three cases. X is either the first point, it's the last point, or it's one of the points somewhere in between. That's what we're listing here, that K is either equal to 1, which means that X is the first point. K is equal to N plus 1, which would, would make uh, X the last point, or K is something between 1 and N plus 1, which makes X one of the points somewhere in between. So let's examine each case separately. So what if X is the first point of that union? But axiom 2 assures us that there's no first point in S, so therefore there has to be some point that precedes X, the first point of the union. So now notice what you've got. You've got X that's going to be in that region from Y to A2. Remember, X is really A1. Uh, and, and it does not intersect F. It's not a subset of F. It's neither is it a, is a subset or it really doesn't intersect. The point is that X is in that region, and F and that region do not intersect. They're empty. So let's look at case two, where X is an endpoint. That is, when X is the last point of the union. So we return to another part of axiom two. It says that S has no last point. So if S has no last point, there's got to be some Z that's in S 
that so that x precedes z. So very similar to the situation when we were looking at a first point, here with the last point we were able to build this region that contains x and does not intersect f. So now we're going to look at case 3. Now notice that one of these cases has to occur. And in case 3, we're saying suppose that x is one of the points somewhere in between this list. It's not the first and it's not the last. So there's got to be some k. So if x isn't the first point and it's not the last point, then there'd have to be some point of f uh, of that union so that uh, that preceded x and there's a point of that union that follows f. Uh, this is a wrong statement here. So there's there's got to be this point that that precedes the the first point that precedes uh, a k in the union and the first point that follows a k in the union. Then that region is going to contain x. And it's also, and the intersection is going to be, and, and F intersected with that region is empty. In other words, the region does not intersect F at all. Okay, so there's the outline of the proof. Now, I'm not going to talk through uh, the written proof, but, uh, I, but when you read somebody's written proof, often you need to 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 kind of do that T diagram. You know, you need to look and say, okay, they're making this particular statement. Why is that statement true? Are they telling me why it's true or do I need to, or are they assuming that I know because I am familiar with the, with the subject that's involved? So in the handout, uh, there's this written proof that I'd like you to be able to read through and see that it makes sense to you. Okay, great. See you online.